Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Advances in Mitral Valve Therapy. If I have yet to meet you, I'm a patient, and I'm also the founder of heartvalvesurgery.com. Our mission at the website is simple. We want to educate and empower patients with heart valve disease. This webinar, which has had 503 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, is designed to support that mission. During the webinar, so you know, all participants will be in what we call listen-only mode. That being said, you may submit questions during the webinar. Simply post your questions in the control panel that's probably on the right top part of your screen. We will do our best to address your questions during the live Q&A section of the webinar. Lastly, as we close the webinar, we're going to ask you to complete a very quick five question survey. Now, I am thrilled to introduce the featured speakers for this session. Dr. Charles Davidson is the medical director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and the clinical chief of cardiology at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Davidson has several areas of expertise, including valvular heart disease, coronary angioplasty, and adult congenital heart disease. Dr. Clyde Yancey is the chief of the Division of Cardiology and professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Most recently, the medical director for Baylor Heart and Vascular Institute and the chief of cardiothoracic transplantation for Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. Dr. Yancey is the immediate past president of the American Heart Association. I could go on and on about the careers of Dr. Davidson and Dr. Yancey and their achievements in cardiac care. Instead, I will tell you that Northwestern, that this Northwestern team is celebrated by our community and for very, very good reason. Since launching this website, the Northwestern Memorial Hospital has successfully treated over 100 patients from our community, including Janet Ruddick, Mark Busiak, Robert Winter, Sarah Bloomfield, Ron Roven, Jean Cook, Sharon Knickerbocker, and the list goes on. Specific to this discussion, I have to shine a light on the MitraClip success stories of Michelle Golden on the left and Charlotte Cummings on the right. Michelle was about to go onto a heart transplant, tra transplant list and Charlotte could barely walk prior to receiving the MitraClip. Now Michelle is back camping and Charlotte is doing what she loves, walking the Windy City. Personally, I am humbled that Dr. Davidson and Dr. Yancey are taking time away from their very busy practices at Northwestern to share their experiences and clinical research during this educational webinar. So to start, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Charles Davidson. Thank you, Adam, and welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Today we're gonna to go through the mitral valve and the anatomy and physiology of it, and then we're gonna to speak to some therapies and also talk about some of the symptoms and heart failure treatments that can also be used in conjunction with mitral valve disease. We have the next slide. So the heart has four valves. It's essentially a muscle pump. There's two valves on the right side of the heart and two on the left side of the heart. The mitral valve uh, is the regulator of blood flow from the top part of the heart, the left atrium, to the bottom part of the heart, the left ventricle. Next slide. This is just showing that the left ventricle and the right ventricle, the left ventricle pumps the blood out to the rest of the body, the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs. We're gonna focus mostly on the left side of the heart today since we're talking about the mitral valve between the left atrium and left ventricle. Next slide, please. So as you can see, as blood comes back from the lungs, it goes into the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then out through the aortic valve. Next. So in the average year, a heart valve is open and closed over 40 million times, and by the age of 65, a heart valve would have opened and closed over 2.6 billion times. I guess it depends how much you exercise throughout your lifetime, but this is kind of an average number. Next slide, please. Five million Americans with moderate or severe mitral regurgitation there are, and about 10% risk uh, for any uh, treatment over the age of 75 years. Worldwide, there's about 20 million patients with rheumatic valve disease, which is a disease that affects the mitral valve primarily, 
causing mitral stenosis, a blockage of the mitral valve. That is not what we're going to speak about today, but it is a very prevalent disease throughout the world, particularly in third world countries. Next. So mitral regurgitation occurs when the mitral valve does not close properly, and then blood, instead of going forward out to the aortic valve, regurgitates or leaks back into the left atrium. What this causes is a fluid overload on the left side of the heart, and the left ventricle can begin to dilate. Atrial arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation can occur as a result of this, and eventually heart failure when the disease becomes more advanced. Next slide, please. And we can go to the next slide. So mitral regurgitation, what are the consequences? As we just to reiterate, causes weakening of the left ventricular muscle because of the extra blood flow in there. It's like a balloon. It gets too much water in it. It stretches out. And then even if you fix it, it may not completely come back to normal if you fix it at too late a stage in the disease. It causes elevated blood pressure in the lungs, known as pulmonary hypertension. That can then transmit back to the right-sided valve called the tricuspid valve, which can also leak and atrial fibrillation and risk of stroke from blood clots that can occur in the left atrium, particularly in the left atrial appendage. Next slide. So when you come to a physician, what should they be doing? And obviously a physical examination should be part of any physician's exam. And usually what the physician will hear is a, is a murmur. And with that, if the mitral regurgitation is becoming more severe, they will develop some water or fluid in the lungs. They can get edema or swelling in the legs or in the feet. Typically at that point, some blood tests would be ordered. Those are EKG, chest X-ray, but all of those really don't diagnose mitral regurgitation very well. The kind of the gold standard test is echocardi echocardiography or transthoracic echocardiogram. And that's essentially an ultrasound of the heart. Next. So mitral regurgitation can occur in two different classifications. One is primary or organic. That means there is an intrinsic problem with the mitral valve. The valve may not have been born normally, may have had mitral valve prolapse that progressed, that the leaflets of the valve were not necessarily constructed properly at birth, and over time they can tend to wear out or cause disruption of the connections of the mitral valve apparatus to cause leaking. The secondary or functional type of mitral regurgitation, which is what, the, what we're going to talk a lot about today in the subject of the COAP trial, is occurs with patients that have had often a previous heart attack or a pad heart failure where there's been stretching of the mitral annulus and therefore causing malcoaptation of the leaflets and regurgitation of blood into the left atrium. Next. This slide is meant to just show you that we can quantify the amount of mitral regurgitation by echocardiography uh, in patients that we have what's called an ERO, greater than 40, meaning more leak they have worse survival. So we do know that there are gradations of mitral regurgitation, and even in the severe range, as it gets more severe, the, the likelihood of survival becomes less with more severe mitral regurgitation. More leak, worse survival. Next slide, please. Next slide. So Adam, thank you for the opportunity to participate today, and I'm delighted that so many people have, have exercised an interest in what it is that we're planning to do. I mean, Charlie, that was a great overview of the mitral valve. And the reason that that's so important is because, as Dr. Davidson identified, this problem with the mitral valve can lead to another scenario, another situation known as heart failure. I'm going to just take a few minutes to let you know what that is, which will set up Dr. Davidson's next discussion with you about how we address the mitral valve to treat those people where it's led on to this condition known as heart failure. Please move forward, Adam. What you see is an image, a moving image on the left of your screen. This is a heart that is terribly weakened. It's probably lost over 70% of its function. The walls are moving very sluggishly. When this occurs, the person in whom this happens feels short of breath, accumulates fluid in the ankles and the abdomen and the lungs, and in general doesn't feel well. If we aren't able to interrupt this process, the concern is that it can go on, and unfortunately, heart failure, when not treated well, can lead to hospitalization and even worse. If we can go forward, Adam. When we think about a definition, I want everyone to appreciate 
that this is not a rare circumstance. If there are indeed 500 people that are interested in today's seminar, at least 100 of us, and I do mean to use the word us, are likely to develop heart failure while we're still alive, mitral valve disease being just one cause. This definition makes it very clear that the condition can be derived from a variety of different sources. That is, it can be because of high blood pressure, it can be because of valvular heart disease, it can be because of blocked blood vessels in the heart, but ultimately it leads to weakness of the heart, retaining fluid, and shortness of breath, which is very much an important consideration. The next, please. Realize that just like there are statistics that Dr. Davidson shared with you about mitral valve disease, there are statistics that are just as worrisome about heart failure. Millions of people have this condition on a regular basis. It does cause death, and we as taxpayers really do pay a very large toll for the cost of heart failure, both direct and indirect. So there are reasons that we should be concerned, public health reasons, economic reasons, and importantly, quality of life and duration of life. Move forward, please, Adam. I share with you this only to let you know that many of you, I'm confident, have heard the diagnosis of heart failure within your family circles, from physicians, from friends, from nurses. I want you to appreciate that what we used to say about heart failure 15 or 20 years ago is no longer accurate. We now have very appropriate and actually proven strategies to treat this condition. That's important in the context of what Dr. Davidson is going to tell you. And as physicians, we follow this template you see before you that is embedded in a concept that's known as a guideline, which is really a set of directives to help physicians know how to approach the condition. I'm sharing this with you today as patients so you can know that we're not guessing when we treat you for heart failure and we're not playing a hunch, nor we're using therapies that are not proven. This graphic demonstrates that there is a strategy in the way we think about this, and there are proven therapies. Please go forward, Adam. Those proven therapies fall in a number of categories, but the first thing we have to do, and this is correct, I've been taking care of patients for 30 years. There's no way I can walk in a room and guess what's wrong. We take a picture first. We take a picture of your heart. If it looks like the picture I just shared with you, we know that there are certain therapies that we necessarily have to use. Again, we as physicians use something like the arrows and what we would call an algorithm that's before you to make the right decision to help you as much as possible. Move forward, please, Adam. One of the things that we talk about in today's world is, is there an app for that? Well, guess what? There is an app for this. Over the years, we've helped to develop some of these guideline statements, and one of those times, we actually developed this Treat HF app. It's in the App Store. We make this easily available and freely available to physicians and care providers so that on the phone, in the pocket, can be these guidelines, these directives on how best to care for heart failure when it occurs. And again, that's incredibly important because any other therapies that happen need to happen after you've been treated as well as possible. Please go forward, Adam. So let me be certain that I help you appreciate the fact that not all heart failure is the same. The heart failure that Dr. Davidson is going to describe for you is where the heart muscle is weakened, like the picture I shared with you. But sometimes the heart muscle is exactly intact. It is sufficiently strong enough, but unfortunately the way in which it works is too stiff, is too thick, and so symptoms can still develop. Occasionally it's somewhere in between. It's not too weak, it's not too strong, it's in between and there are symptoms that happen there. For the heart muscle that is very vigorous, that leads to symptoms, many times that's usually an older woman with high blood pressure. For the person who has a heart that's very weak, it's someone like today with a heart valve problem or someone that's had a heart attack or someone that's had a specific heart muscle disease. Please go forward, Adam. So what I've tried to share with you is that as you're appreciating the information we're giving you, the reason we have such a focus on this mitral valve is that it ultimately can lead to weakening of the heart muscle. At that point in time, there are therapies that we can use to treat the condition, and if those therapies don't work well, we can go on to some of the other therapies Dr. Davidson is going to describe. Probably the key most important issue is trying to prevent heart failure from occurring, and that is because of early diagnosis and taking appropriate strategies to intervene soon, and that includes lifestyle. Charlie? Thanks, Clay. That was excellent. Um, I think the most important point there is prevention is the best op option here. 
certainly. Then the next step, if uh, the patient develops heart failure, is going to become medical therapy. When medical therapy uh, is ineffective, often the mitral valve is implicated in one of the causes, as it was alluded to. Can we have the next slide, please. So traditionally, when the mitral valve was leaking severely, the only uh, treatments were medical therapy or ineffective. There was surgical mitral valve repair or replacement. A few years back, patients that had degenerative, as I talked about before, that means a, a problem with the valve from birth, essentially, that then leaked a lot. There was an approval for a device that were patients that were high risk for surgery, and this was called the mitral clip, which is essentially a staple that pulls together the leaflets of the valve that are not coming together and improves the leak. That was shown to be effective in high risk patients that had, again, degenerative mitral regurgitation. Next slide. So let me just show you how a mitral clip works. This is done from a leg vein. We cross from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, and then this tube is maneuvered across the mitral valve. We use echocardiography, transesophageal echocardiography, general anesthesia, and then we capture the leaflets where the leak is occurring, and then we pull together those leaflets with this staple-like device called a mitral clip. We can then examine it in the transesophageal echo and under fluoroscopy, make sure we have it in the right spot. Once we do, we can then release it and make sure that the leak is improved. And we can place one of these, two of these, or even three of these as necessary. The majority of patients receive one to two, and if done correctly in appropriate population, we can get an excellent result. This mirrors a surgical uh, procedure or surgical operation called the Alfieri clip and uh, is now done percutaneously or through a leg vein. Patients are typically able to go home the next day and can get up in bed and are eating usually later in the day. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Adam? I think this shows it very nicely. So when it was understood that this worked for people with degenerative, the question was what happens with people with weak heart muscles that are not doing well with medical therapy and have a leaking mitral valve? And as we knew before, as I said earlier, the only thing that could be done was medical therapy. And so in this study that was recently completed and published late last year, over 600 patients were enrolled in 80 centers. We were one of the participating sites in this study. And it was patients with severe greater than three plus functional mitral regurgitation. They were all on guideline directed medical heart failure therapy. They were all seen by our heart failure specialist. And they were all deemed not necessarily appropriate for mitral valve surgery due to either comorbidities, advanced age or severe uh, LV or left ventricular dysfunction, and they had to have the anatomy that was thought to be suitable for a clip to be applied. Half the patients received the device and half received standard medical therapy. And the patients were followed up for a series of months and out, now are being followed up out to five years. I'm going to present you some of the data that we have available to date. Next. So just to give you a flavor of this, here's a patient that we had with severe functional mitral regurgitation that agreed to be in the COAP trial. As a 70-year-old, that had had actually a prior mitral valve ring for functional mitral regurgitation, but then developed further mitral regurgitation. Uh, the patient had some uh, blood tests that showed that they were in heart failure despite medical therapy and got enrolled in the COAP trial and, and was randomized to um, mitral clip therapy. As you can see on that right-hand moving image there, that the valve leaflets do not co-op well. That kind of black in the middle should not appear as the leaflets come together, and as you can see, they're not coming together, producing a leak in the mitral valve, what we call poor leaflet coaptation. Next slide, please. So just to give you a flavor, as I said, that's the echocardiogram on the far left. And Adam, maybe you can go on mute. That's the echocardiogram on the far left. There's the uh, fluoroscopy on the right that we use to guide it across the ring. The ring is that, that kind of a metal wire that you see the clip is going right through. Come down a little bit to the right there. There you go, right there. And then if you go over to the far right image, you'll see the mitro clip right there. Move up a little bit, Adam, up, up, up. Right, yeah, and to the left uh, here, that's that big white thing kind of moving between. That's us trying to capture the leaflets under echocardiography. So it's a little bit like playing your best video game if you're, if you, once you get really good at this. Next slide, please. And so now in that upper left image, you can see that, that the leaflets have been grasped. 
the color is what you're seeing, the blue and, and red and orange are the amount of leaking left. So there's minimal amount of leaking in this valve. The clip is then released in the in the slide below that, uh, right below it in the right there, yes. And then the uh, final result uh, shows that almost minimal leak uh, and trivial what we call mitral regurgitation on the far right slide. Next slide, please. So these results were published and presented at our national meeting in September, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is just what the patients looked like. Average age was 72. Uh, most of them were high risk. Uh, about a third had had prior defibrillators placed in, and and uh, about uh, the mean ejection fraction was uh, was 30%. Normal was over 50%. So these are people with pretty severely dysfunctional ventricles. Next slide. These are the medications are on, which are the standard guideline medications for heart failure therapies. Next slide. So this was one of the few home runs you ever see in cardiology. And this is showing in the top blue bars patients that got guideline medical therapy and how many heart failure hospitalizations they had within two years. And it was about 283 and 151 patients. If you look at the group that got mitral clip plus therapy, it was only 160 hospitalizations. So that was a massive reduction, if you will, uh, over a 50% or on close to a 50% reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. Next slide. So when we, we talk about these things, is how many patients would you need to treat to prevent a hospitalization? And it's approximately three patients you would need to treat to prevent one hospitalization, which is a, a huge treatment effect. When you think about quality of life improvement. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So well, that was exciting. Yes, we improved people's quality of life, but could we actually improve patients' survival? And the, and the exciting part of this trial was that we did improve patient survival. 46% died within two years if they just got guideline therapy, but with the CLIP, it was down to 29%. That means that only six patients have to be treated to save one life, which is a huge treatment effect for anything we do in cardiovascular disease or really for any treatment of within the body when you think about it. Next slide. The question is, it worked, but was it safe? And what this showed on the right side is there was very minimal complications. Uh, there were there were only a handful out of the 293 patients that had any device-related complications throughout the procedure and through 12 months. Next slide. I just want to highlight, there's a busy slide, but I want to highlight the bottom part of it. And, the, and what's exciting here is that here's patients, as the, we showed in one of the examples that uh, Adam showed, is that on guideline therapy, 9.5% went on to having either an, a VAD, ventricular assist device, or heart transplant. But with MitraClip, it was over 50% reduction, only 4.4%. If you look at the number for transplant, it was 3.6% down to 1.4. And for VAD, it went from 7.1 down to 3. So all of these were, were improved significant improvements in the combined heart, fat, heart transplant and VAD and, and ventricular assist device alone. Next slide. Slide. So Charlie, I wish that this was two-way because when we train, that kind of mitral valve surgery that required open heart surgery, 30% of the people didn't survive. And now we're talking about doing it in a cath lab, it's basically a clip. And you see more and more people surviving, but saving lives from a really desperate outcome, heart transplant, or an LVAD. Adam, if you can go to the next graphic. Dr. Yancey, I don't believe we're, we can hear you. If you maybe press mute on your, on your phone. Hello? 
Oh, there you go. There we go. Great, great. We're back up. I hope that we still have our audience engaged because this has been a fascinating discussion, particularly for patient populations to appreciate. You've seen some technology, and the last thing that Dr. Davidson shared with you was the ability to avoid having to undergo a heart transplant or receive a mechanical heart. I want everyone to know that 51 years ago, we witnessed the first heart transplant. Think about that. It's been 51 years we've been talking about this, and we're still having to deal with this very dramatic operation for patients who have heart failure that can't be treated any other way. That's an important reason why this approach to the mitral valve really is a necessary discussion to have for everyone because there's an alternative we didn't have before. Please move forward, Adam. Heart transplant was not easy. Shortly after the first one was done, there was a moratorium, unprecedented then and even now in medicine, where everyone involved said, we've got to stop doing this because we are harming people, we're killing patients. But some brave souls continued. You go to the next graphic, please. There was ongoing discussion about what's the right thing to do. Surgeons in Texas were famously trying to develop an artificial heart, in part enabled by the permission from Lyndon Johnson, then president, who had heart failure and was dying of heart failure and really wanted someone to develop an artificial heart to save his own life. But these two famous surgeons ended up focusing on developing artificial hearts and had a famous feud, but their progress has made great inroads and allowed us to treat many people today with technologies that are incredibly effective. Go forward, please. This is public information, but the picture you see of the man smiling the most is the CEO of United Airlines, who has received an LVAD, that is a mechanical heart, and a transplant here at Northwestern supported by the medical director of our transplant program, Dr. Alan Anderson, the gentleman to his right, and the surgeon, Dr. Doug Pham, the gentleman to his left. This really has been an example of the kind of heroic things that we can do now for people that have this advanced heart failure that's not otherwise treatable. Go forward, please. We know that there are only a few people with heart failure that end up with this kind of advanced disease part of which is driven by the valve disease that Dr. Ed Davison has shared with you. If you go forward one more, Adam, you'll see that that number, once again, really is a fairly small number measured in the several hundred thousand range and even smaller number that's attributable to this leaking heart valve. But this is the circumstance we get when all else fails that we have to do transplants or VADs. Please go forward, Adam. These are all the different therapies. You've already heard about the valve repair that we can do through the skin, which is a stunning development. But we can do the transplant, as I've shared with you. We can do the mechanical heart. Then in the lower left, we can do medical therapy with pills. That's what I do. I give people lots of pills. And then on the right, you can see the hand holding. That's palliation. That's hospice. That's helping people at a very important stage of life. Go forward, please, Adam. This is what the mechanical heart looks like. I won't dissect all of the things you see here, but there's a device that we can implant that is a near permanent install. It is driven by an external battery pack that is rechargeable. We've kept patients alive for many years on these devices, and the devices continue to get better and better with fewer and fewer complications, but they're not yet perfect tools. Go forward, please, Adam. So, Charlie, can you wrap this up? Well, hopefully the echo is not bothering people too much, catching at least on our end. But what we want to do is talk about what did we go over today and what may be next for the mitral valve and other valves for that matter. Next slide, please. So what mitral valve disease challenges and innovation is how I'd summarize this. Mitral regurgitation is associated with higher mortality rates. The more leaking, the more severe the mortality rates are more frequent. Mitral valve disease can lead to heart failure, which requires specific other therapies. And the COAP trial demonstrated improved survival and quality of life in patients undergoing transcatheter, that's non-surgical mitral valve repair, compared to ideal medical therapy for heart failure. Remember, all of these patients were maximized on medical therapy already. And mitral clip may be really the new standard of care for patients with functional mitral regurgitation. However, many patients are not necessarily eligible due to anatomy, so patients should be carefully selected as they were in this trial. 
not one size fits all. In patients with previous bioprosthetic mitral valve replacement or repair with valvular degeneration, the mitral transcatheter valve therapy is a potential option. So even with prior surgery, there may be options for transcatheter mitral therapies. And the next slide. So what is out there, and we're just now looking to more forward thinking, these are investigational trials that we're performing at Northwestern. The partner trials were all aortic valve replacements versus uh, from a transcatheter approach from the femoral artery. These are being done thousands a year, thousands a year throughout the U.S. and are now commercially available for patients who are intermediate or high risk. This Sunday, there'll be a very exciting trial presented, which will be the partner three trial looking at patients that are low risk that were compared to transcatheter valve versus surgical aortic valve replacement. And I, we're all anticipating these results. It'll be in the New England Journal of Medicine as well that day. The hope is that it will be the same as surgery as far as results. And if that's the case, it can really open up this to a, a larger population of patients. Uh, cardioband tricuspid is essentially a ring that's placed around the mitral valve, almost like a surgical ring. This is also done from a leg vein under ultrasound guidance. We've now done the most of these that have been done in the United States and uh, really getting some very nice results. Once again, these are often for patients that may not be good surgical candidates and are having leaking on their tricuspid valve. Previously participated in the Trialine tricuspid valve, which is a kind of a, another one that mirrors surgical treatment by putting pledgets to kind of pull together the annulus and improve the mitral regurgitation. And the next slide. The Cardiband mitral is a similar type of ring, but now placed on the mitral side. So that's really, a lot of these valves that you're seeing developed now for the mitral are also applicable to the tricuspid and vice versa. So you know, there's a whole plethora of new devices coming available. The, and everyone is really energized by the fact that we've seen such great results from the COAP trial that other repair techniques that mirror surgery may be available and may be also helpful. In the more severe stages of mitral regurgitation, we're doing two trials at, the, at Northwestern. One is the cardiac, which is a mitral valve replacement from a transcatheter approach done transeptally, again, from the vein in the leg across the septum of the heart. And then there's the Apollo trial, which is a transapical approach, which comes up from the apex, the tip of the heart, and replaces the valve. So these are more severe stages of mitral regurgitation that may not be eligible for the repair clip or these banding type of techniques. And the next slide. So now we're going to move into questions. I think Adam's going to uh, host the uh, questions here. And yep. second of all, before we get to that, I want to thank you all. Clyde, that was outstanding there. And uh, we want to hopefully answer any questions you have in uh, had during the talk today. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to echo that. On behalf of our community, Dr. Davidson and Dr. Yancey and, and Jane Cruz, who's a nurse, uh, a nurse coordinator in the Valve Center, uh, who's helped uh, assemble this webinar materials. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. And you really have uh, brought some context into and shed some light on the whole uh, connections of heart failure and mitral valve disease. This has been a gap, I would say, in our educational content. So this was a definite learning experience for me and I'm sure the other patients on the line. And now we can move into uh, the questions and answer section. And, and literally Dr. Davidson and Dr. Yancey, since we posted the webinar, my inbox has received a, a, a ton of questions from our patients, and we thought we'd just uh, uh, spend the rest of our time together answering uh, those questions or asking an answer. And the first one comes in from Rose, and it's about mitral calcification, a little different than what we talked about in terms of the regurgitation, but she says, hi, Adam, I'm scheduled to have uh, open heart surgery on May 14th due to severe mitral calcification. Is there any procedure that can be utilized to repair or replace my mitral valve without undergoing open heart surgery? So this is my, called mitral annular calcification. It can cause either leaking or blockage in the valve and usually causes both. And unfortunately, this is an unmet need for all of the techniques we talked about today. The mitral calcium and, and calcification of the valve is not treated very well by, by the clip technique because there's already some blockage in the valve and that might cause further blockage. And these banding techniques don't tend to anchor very well into it as well. And even the valve replacements by the catheter approach 
or not quite strong enough valves to hold open that calcium at this point. So at this point in time, a surgery still remains the only viable option for severe mitral calcification causing mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis. Charlie, if I can add to that, Adam, um, please make certain that Rosa knows that as we did the studies to understand if we can get to the mitral valve through the skin and make the repair happen, over half the patients that we evaluated to be a part of the study were no longer able to go forward because either they responded to medical treatments for their heart failure or the structure of their valve, as we see with this situation from Rose, really made them not be a good candidate. So that's why you have to have a really good conversation with your cardiologist and understand what are the risks, what are the benefits, and what's best for your condition. Great. Excellent patient selection gives excellent outcomes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And then the whole question about watchful waiting, which is a term that some patients on the phone, uh, on, the, on the webinar may know, and some patients may not. But Ricardo asks, what signals for a patient are there that the watchful waiting period is nearing its end? Are there key measurements in an echocardiogram summary that alerts the patient to this? So this is an outstanding question, and there's a, actually a whole algorithm related to this. The first question you need to know is what's the cause of the mitral regurgitation? And if it's functional mitral regurgitation, we try to treat with medications first, clip maybe second, and then surgery if they're not eligible for clip or some of the experimental. If it's primary or, again, degenerative mitral regurgitation, then there are a number of parameters that we utilize on echocardiography related to the amount of leaking that we can quantify, related to the left ventricular function, related to pulmonary artery pressures. So there are several parameters that we look at. Uh, in, in a patient that is asymptomatic but has severe mitral regurgitation. And those should be carefully evaluated. And I will say that not all echocardiograms are created equally. You want to be examined and followed up at a center that does a lot of this work because it's not just the cardiologist that's doing the intervention or the surgeon, but it's the whole team around them in echocardiography getting good quantitative measures of the amount of leak and the amount of LV function dis, uh, dysfunction or pulmonary artery pressures are, are extremely important uh, in order to make this decision very carefully and thoughtfully. So surgery is offered at the right time, no sooner and no later. So Adam, let me agree with Charlie that this really is a brilliant question. This concept of watchful waiting is not exactly something we embrace as much anymore because over the years we've learned that we can wait too long. And when we wait too long, the outcomes may not be as good as we'd wish. There are key measurements that are completely vetted, evidence-based, and proven to be accurate. And we just have to make certain, as Dr. Davidson said, that people that have mitral valve disease have an opportunity to be evaluated by someone with real expertise, studied in a lab that can get really high-quality images so that a team can make this decision. But you don't want to wait too long because it can only lead to a more challenging circumstance. And, and so this is a great question. The stenotic valves or blocked valves typically present with symptoms, but leaking valves, when symptoms occur, is often the, to the point that there's actually been significant damage done to the heart. And so the echocardiogram becomes the best measure to follow these patients because often we want to get to them before symptoms develop and based on dilation of the heart, LV function, pulmonary artery pressures, and the like. Great. Uh, let's let's keep going on. And here's a question about um, reoperations, which as patients, many of us on the line realize that oftentimes uh, a procedure is not a lifeline, lifelong fix. Um, and so Lisa asks, I had a mitral valve repair three years ago, but within months I was back to moderate regurgitation. Recently, my surgeon brought up the MitraClip solution to reduce regurgitation. Will the MitraClip prevent me from a possible open heart re-repair in the future, or could the mitral clip actually be a long-term solution? So Adam, this really is an important question because there's a lot that Lisa has embedded here. We need to understand why the surgeon believes something else needs to be done. This actually could be heart failure getting worse, and treating the heart failure might be the better option, at least at first glance. This could be something else about the valve. 
it's really important to have a very comprehensive look. I think neither I nor Dr. Davidson can give Lisa a direct response. We wish we could, but we want to let her know that it's important to have a global evaluation because there may be other strategies that would help slow the process down or maybe restore her quality of life. But it's really key that, again, a team takes a comprehensive look at everything that's going on. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, if I was advising Lisa, I'd say, go be seen by a heart failure specialist. Get all the best medications that you can get. See how this mitral regurgitation responds. And if it does not respond appropriately to medication, the mitral clip could be an option based on the anatomy. You'd have to see you know, what, what the leaflets look like, how much blockage there is, but it is a possibility. But the first place to start would be to optimize medical therapy and then look at, and then look at catheter-based options if those are not uh, uh, working properly for it. Right. it could be a long solution. It is, best we know, it is a durable solution at this point. Okay, well, I hope that helped Lisa. And then moving on to rheumatic fever, I know, I, I believe Dr. Davids, er, Davidson, earlier you were talking about rheumatic fever, and Kathy asked, are there options for valve replacement for someone like me who has severe mitral regurgitation due to having rheumatic fever as a child? So, Kathy, one of the things that we understand about rheumatic fever, particularly when it's been lifelong, is that part of what the expectation is, is that the valve will develop that calcium, the same thing that we talked about a few questions ago. So this gets back to the same conversation that we just had, specifically being that a team has to look very carefully at the anatomy of the valve and determine if it's approachable. Severe mitral regurgitation independently is something that needs an intervention. And so it's a real exercise of a lot of people coming together to decide what's that right next intervention. Whether or not replacement like we've talked about today is appropriate for her situation really is going to depend on how the valve looks. Charlie? Yeah, typically with mitral regurgitation from rheumatic fever, there's a fair amount of mitral stenosis as well, which makes the catheter-based options not that feasible. And there's also a fair amount of subvalvular disease it also restricts the leaflet. So often when mitral uh, regurgitation occurs as a result of mitral fever, excuse me, rheumatic fever, uh, mitral valve replacement becomes the, the best option. Now, isolated mitral stenosis, which is not what the question is, can be often treated with balloons when it occurs from rheumatic fever. But this sounds like it's going to be more of a surgical approach. Okay. And then mitral clip durability. Um, Obviously, this is one of the big questions that patients have about all procedures. And Linda asks, how long does the mitra clip last on average? That's a great question. Uh, as I showed in the COAP trial, we have two-year data that looks very durable. There doesn't seem to be any, any decrement on the functionality of the valve or in the amount of regurgitation recurring at that point in time. The original trial that was done called the Everest trial also had data out for a few years. We do not have 10-year data on this yet. We barely have any five-year data that's well collected. So I think time will tell. The only uh, analogy I could make that might be useful is what we know with the Alfieri surgical clip. And we know that that's generally a durable approach if it works initially. So we, we would be optimistic that this would mirror that, but uh, data beyond really two years, three years is not well collected at this point in time uh, to be continued. Charlie, this really does give us the opportunity to emphasize that this is a percutaneous through the skin procedure. You're saving yourself a trip to the operating room. Right. So when you're thinking about risk, benefits, and lifestyle, being able to avoid a surgery is not a trivial issue. And so, again, there's a conversation that's important to be had here. Even if you're delaying surgery, which I don't think this is, but even if it was, that may be a benefit rather than going to surgery earlier on. Great. Uh, one other question that has come up is uh, about clinical trials, Dr. Davidson, Dr. Yancey. And Jerry asked a question, uh, my doc brought up a clinical trial. I was a bit hesitant to participate in something that is not tested. Why are patients doing these studies are they safe? 
So I really would like to address this question because I've done a lot of work with the FDA and I'm still working with the FDA to find better ways to do clinical trials. Jerry, you really bring up an unbelievably important point. The only way people like Dr. Davidson and I know how best to care for patients is through getting data under controlled circumstances so we can understand what works best, what doesn't work as well. The advantage of being in a trial, other than the notion of contributing to knowledge, is this. We make absolutely certain that every patient in a trial receives whatever the standard of care for that condition happens to be at that time. So the nurse coordinators that govern the trial, that is the conduct of the trial, are really tasked to be certain that if it's an indicated therapy, that patient is on that therapy. It's remarkable, Jerry, that in virtually every cardiovascular trial that comes forward, the group that's in the control arm, not getting the indicated therapy or the tested therapy, actually does much better than the group in the regular population. That is, patients come into trials and don't receive better care, they receive almost ideal care. That raises the bar, but that means that when something's been proven to be beneficial, like the mitral clip, it's been against a very good standard of care. So I can't vouch for every trial that's ever been done, but in general, the patients who enter a trial receive excellent care, and even if they're in the control group or the reference group, their outcomes are better than had they not been. But a great question, and one that many of us are working on to improve this going forward. Specific to device trials, and I've been doing those for close to 30 years now, it's important to have a heart team approach to these patients so when someone comes in with any problem related to a heart valve disease, we really, they're evaluated by cardiology, which includes a heart failure cardiologist, it involves an interventional cardiologist, a cardiac surgeon, and an echocardiographer, and often a radiologist to do, the, to do our CAT scan imaging of these. So all of us look at the patient and try to offer what are the best options. And, and we look at medical therapy, we look at catheter-based therapies, that are approved and then those that might be investigational. If you notice, most of these trials that we talked about are starting with high-risk patients for surgical therapies. And so often the surgical therapies are known to be at a certain high risk for mortality and therefore we know the disease has a higher risk of mortality and we're looking for options for these patients that are not necessarily commercially available. Through the work through Dr. Yancey and others at the FDA, we are now seeing early feasibility trials in the United States where often these trials were being done in South America or Eastern Europe where patients were getting tested there and the results would come out and we didn't know how well the data were collected. And so what we're trying to understand here is under the best of circumstances with the right patients, what type of results can we get? But clearly with these trials, you should have a discussion with your physician, how many have been done, what have the results looked like thus far, and understand what the risks and benefits might be for your particular situation. Jerry, the last thing I'll tell you is that there are many, many types of clinical trials. In today's world, we're using the electronic health record a lot more than we did before. We're using machine learning a lot more than we did before. We're using certain blood tests to help us figure out who exactly is at risk and how best can we study the smallest number of people to get the biggest amount of information. So don't be hesitant to raise a few additional questions about trials. They're not all the same, and we continue to change the model to make it better for the patient. Great, great question, Jerry. Thanks, Dr. Davidson, Dr. Yancey. We're going to go on to another question, but before, I just want to uh, uh, pass along to Dr. Davidson and the entire Northwestern team. Paul Powers is on the line, and he just says, uh, Dr. Davidson and the Northwestern team saved my life with the first ever mitral valve in valve in March of 2016. Thanks so much. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what a mitral valve in valve is? <laughs> Thanks for the applause. Yeah, so good. Thanks for joining us today, Mr. Powers. Yeah, that, he was the first one we did on that, and that uh, he had had a previous mitral valve replacement that was degenerating, not working well. We know that the surgical valves in the mitral position typically around 10 years can start having some difficulty and his was having it and the option for him was a second operation or a mitral valve and valve. It's done a lot like that mitral clip that you see. We come up through a femoral vein, through a vein in the groin, cross over from the right side to the left side of the heart. And what we used in him was a valve that uh, is 
constructed for the aortic valve, that one I showed you from the partner trial, sapien valve, and we placed it across the degenerative mitral valve that was, that was placed surgically, and essentially that becomes a new functioning valve connecting the left atrium and the left ventricle. It done transeptally, transvenous, and uh, I remember going up to see him later in the afternoon, and he was up eating lunch, and I'm thinking, well, that's probably better than a second operation in the chest, and uh, I'm thrilled to hear that he's still doing well, and uh, thankful that he, he let us uh, go, go at this for our first case, and now, since then, we've done a lot of them. It's become much more common, but uh, yeah, you kind of have to start somewhere, and we had done a lot of these in the aortic position, but not, none in the uh, mitral valve and valve. Now it's being done mitral valve and valve and aortic valve and valve procedures. Yeah, and I was fortunate to meet Paul. Paul, I hope you are still enjoying all of your great walks. I know that was a big part of your recovery. And uh, just, we have to ask this question, and this one's coming from me, Dr. Uh, Yancey and Dr. Davidson. It's just about the future. And, you know, I had my procedure done in 2005, and it just seems like there has been this rapid evolution in new devices. And I've just got to ask you, with all the advances we have discussed today, what, what do you think is the future of mitral valve therapy? Could these transcatheter devices replace the need for surgical uh, intervention in the future? Yeah, that's a terrific question. In aortic valve disease, we've made huge strides in 10 years, going from the extreme risk patients to now down to low risk patients. And it really, at Northwestern, over 75% of our aortic valve replacements are done via catheter approach. Only about 20% are done from uh, surgery at this point. The mitral valve is much more complex than the aortic valve, as we tried to show you today. The anatomy of that area is much more difficult, and the pathology is not as homogeneous as various causes of mitral valve disease. And so I would say possibly, but this is more of a long-term play. This is not going to be flip the switch in five years from now, we're doing it all transcatheter. And I don't think it's going to be a one-size-fits-all as well with this. There's going to be repair techniques. There's going to be replacement techniques. And there may be combinations of transcatheter repair techniques. But in the, in the, in the short term, these therapies will be applied primarily to high-risk patients as we learn more, gather more information, the technology improves, and then we'll eventually migrate to a lower-risk group. But I do think this is quite a while before we'll see this if you want to use the word replace, and I don't know if that will ever occur, but even transform to a 50% or more, it's going to be quite a while for that to occur. So Adam, one other perspective from Charlie, that was a great response. One other perspective is that not everyone develops aortic stenosis, meaning that there's a way to avoid it. Not everyone develops mitral insufficiency. That means there's a way to avoid it. The kind of mitral insufficiency we're talking about today is largely due to underlying heart failure first. We really are rushing towards treatments and strategies that can prevent heart failure from ever occurring. If you don't ever have heart failure, then you won't have this kind of mitral valve disease. And so that's not something that far down the road. We really are developing the right steps to prevent that part of cardiovascular disease from happening. It's a big burden, it's a big effort because so many people are at risk, but that will take shape as we go forward. We are fascinated about the biology of some of these heart valve conditions. Some of that may be because of genetics, some of that may be because of the environment, some of that may be because of diet or lifestyle issues. But as we keep exploring not only these brilliant strategies that Dr. Davison explained about using minimally invasive approaches going through the skin to repair and replace valves. The group with which I work most closely is really focused on how can we interrupt this process at the very, very beginning. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, but we're committed to trying to get those answers. Well, fan, fan, fantastic and just incredibly said, Dr. Davidson and Dr. Yancey about the potential for these procedures and the prevention that is also required here. And with that response, we are gonna conclude the Q&A section of the webinar, but please uh, don't exit just yet. On behalf of our community, uh, I wanna go ahead and extend uh, an incredible, extraordinary thank you uh, to Dr. Yancey and Dr. Davidson for sharing their expertise with us today. It's been an excellent, excellent session. And as we end the webinar, I'd like to thank you all the attendees for your participation in this community event. It's always great to get together with you. 
uh, online in real time. And lastly, as we close uh, this webinar, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you could take a, a quick minute here to complete uh, a five question survey that is about to appear on your screen. And as we always say here at heartvalvesurgery.com, uh, keep on ticking. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Yancey and Dr. Davidson and Jane for all your help uh, getting together with our community today. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam.